Let us pray. Dear Lord, as we come, we ask that you would bless us today. Give us a word from you, a word that will build us up, a word that will encourage us, a word that will strengthen us, a word that will help us to pray. Lord, give us a love for prayer. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. For the next 40 days, beginning in September, September the 10th, we're going to be observing the 40 days of prayer. But I thought I would kick it off today because I just want us to get in the mindset and the spirit of prayer. The Lord wants us to pray. And there are different areas in which you and I can pray. We can pray for people that are lost, people that are in our families that don't know the Lord. The Lord expects us to pray and ask him to, to save them. Amen. Uh, those that are sick in body, troubled in mind, God expects us and wants us to pray because when we pray, we get him involved in our circumstances. And so what we're going to do uh, beginning today we're going to observe the 40 days of prayer. At this time, I'd like to just acknowledge that for the next two months, the sermons are already being prepared. And, and the Lord is going to bless us tremendously as we look at different examples and different types of prayer. Different prayers that people have prayed and received answers from God. This morning, we want to cover the prayer that is prayed out of a broken heart. At one point or another in life, you and I will have a broken heart. And I want us to see what it looks like when you pray out of a broken heart. If you have your Bibles, I'd like for you to turn with me to 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel chapter number 1. We want to see an example of a prayer prayed out of a broken heart. 1 Samuel chapter number 1. We want to just give you some background on this passage. We know that this is during the time of the judges. In judges chapter 17 verse 6 says, In those days, everyone did what was right in their own eyes. In Israel, there was no king. And so the people began to live how they felt they ought to live. They didn't have authority and they didn't want God. And so they began to put their lives together in their own way, according to their own wisdom. It's in that same vacuum, it's in that same time that we learn of a family. A family that was from Ephraim. Look what it says in the first chapter. We want to begin reading at verse 1. There was a certain man from Ramathim, a Zophite, from the hill country of Ephraim, whose name was Elkanah, son of Jeroham, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zoph, an Ephraimite. He had two wives. One was called Hannah and the other Peninnah. And Peninnah had children, but Hannah had none. Here we find that there is a family from Ephraim. And this man who is the head of the family, the Bible says his name was Elkanah. And he had two wives. One was Hannah and the other Peninnah. The Bible doesn't condone polygamy. It doesn't condone having more than one wife. But we know God, he has a permissive will. But God's intent was always for there to be one man for one woman for one lifetime. But the tradition of that day in the biblical period, the tradition was that if your wife could not bear you a son, you could go out and get another wife who could bear you a son. That was the custom of that day. I know it's kind of strange. Abraham did it and this man Elkanah also did it. God never condoned it, but it happened. The Bible lets us know that this family was from Ephraim. Elkanah had two wives, one named Hannah and the other Peninnah. 
Now what we know about this passage is that Elkanah really loved Hannah. But she could not bear him a child. His love was for Hannah. But Peninnah was able to give him children. And so you see here that this is setting the stage for conflict. We know that conflict happened because of what we find in verses 3 and following. Year after year, this man went up from his town to worship and to sacrifice to the Lord Almighty at Shiloh, where Huthni and Phinehas, the two sons of Eli, were priests of the Lord. Whenever the day came for Elkanah to sacrifice, he would give portions of the meat to his wife Peninnah and to all her sons and daughters, but to Hannah he gave a double portion because he loved her, and the Lord closed her womb. Now we see here that there is a problem because Elkanah showed his love for Hannah. Even though Peninnah gave him sons and daughters, Peninnah didn't have his love. She had his children, but she didn't have his heart. But Hannah had Elkanah's heart. And see, that's why God never ordained there for a man to have two wives, because you can't love two people with the same intensity. Amen? You can't love two people the same way. Isn't that right? As a matter of fact, God said you can't even love him and love money at the same time. Your devotion has to be to one thing or one person. You cannot love two people the same way. And it shows itself over and over again in the Bible. Amen. It tells us that when they would go to Shiloh, Shiloh was the place of worship at this time. Every year they would go. As a matter of fact, each Jewish male was required to go to Shiloh three times a year to offer a sacrifice. Well, it was a custom during that time when they would go to worship that Peninnah would remind Hannah of her problem. Her problem of not being able to bear children for Elkanah. She would be sitting there at the table with her sons and her daughters. And she would rub it in. She would say, I got the children. I got the sons and the daughters. What do you have? But the Bible says because Elkanah loved Hannah. When the meat was distributed, he gave meat to Peninnah. But to Hannah, he gave a double portion. You see, he loved her and he showed his love by what he did. Well, the Bible says because of this, Peninnah began to provoke her and began to irritate her and began to cause her to be downhearted. Peninnah would rub it in so much till Hannah would break down in tears she would weep and she would not eat. You see, when there's grief in your spirit, you cannot eat. And so she was downhearted. She was depressed. The Bible also says that she was miserable, that she had bitterness in her soul. Amen. Because of her rival. Because of this constant uh, reminder of our inability to have children. Well, when I search the Bible, I find that uh, Hannah was not in this situation alone. For the Bible says that Sarai was barren. The Bible says that Rebecca was barren. The Bible says that Rachel was barren. The Bible says that Manoah's wife was barren who gave birth to Samson and now it tells us that Hannah was barren and then when we get into the New Testament it says that Elizabeth was barren I want you to know that wherever you find a woman in the scripture that is barren God is setting her up for a blessing 
You see, in Israel, God said, I will not allow your women to be barren. It was looked down upon during that time because if you weren't able to have a child, it was believed that there was some sin in your life. And so Hannah had all of these things circling around in her head. That she was unfit, that she was a sinner, that she could not bear a son to her husband. She had a rival who constantly reminded her of her inability to produce a child. But one thing I like about Hannah, she took her problems to the Lord. And you see, when there is a situation in your life that you can't change and you can't do anything about it, I tell you, we do right to follow her example by taking it to the Lord. See, one time they were there at the table and she got up from the table and she went down to the temple. And when she got to the temple, she found that Eli was sitting there by the doorpost. Eli was there, the priest. But Hannah went off in a distance. She had a rival who constantly reminded her of her inability to produce a child. You see, sometimes when you go through things, you begin to understand and you begin to see God in a totally new way. Nobody said that he was the almighty God until Hannah said it. And I tell you, she went through something and she was able to see God a little clearer than a lot of other people. You see, when you go through things in life, God is setting you up for a blessing. Some folk think God is out to get them, but I want you to know Hannah knew that God was the almighty God. And that if he wanted to change her circumstances, he had the power to do it. And so she prayed. She prayed out of her misery. She prayed out of her anguish. She prayed out of her bitter soul. And she asked the Lord to give her a son. She didn't ask for son. She just asked the Lord for one baby boy. And she said, if you give me a baby boy, I'm going to give him back to you. You see, sometimes when parents get children, they raise the children up for themselves. But Hannah had sense enough to realize that God is the source of all life. And that God was worthy to have that child given back to him. You see, some people don't really trust that God would take care of their children. They think they'll do a better job than God. But Hannah said, Lord, if you give me a child, I'm going to give him back to you. She made a vow. She said, no razor will ever touch his head. She prayed a Nazarite vow found in Numbers chapter 6. She said that this young boy will be consecrated to the Lord all the days of his life. She prayed. And Eli, the priest, saw her praying. He didn't hear any words. All he saw was her lips moving. And he concluded that she must be drunk. She has come to the house of the Lord and she's drunk because she is speaking with, she's moving her mouth, but no words are coming out. And see, her anguish and her grief was so deep till it was too deep for words. Have you ever been there? Have you ever been on your knees and so downhearted that words couldn't come out? You just had to pray in your spirit. There wasn't a word to put, there wasn't a phrase that really would encapsulate how you felt inside. All you could do is say, mm hmm. All you could do is hum before the Lord. Amen? Amen. Martin Luther said, when I can't pray, I sing. <laughs> you see, sometimes in life, the problems come and our problem and our pain are too deep for words. Every year, every year she would be teased. Every year she would be mocked. Every year she would be reminded of her inability to produce a child. But one day, Different than all of the other days. She said, I'm going to go down to the temple and I'm going to pray to the Lord. She came to the one place that 
she could find help. But the preacher said she's drunk. You know that's what happened in the early church when the Holy Spirit came down on the believers. They began to speak in tongues and folks said they are drunk. But Peter stood up and said it's only 9 o'clock in the morning. This is to fulfill what was said by Joel the prophet. In the latter days God would pour out of his spirit upon all flesh. He began to interpret that thing. He said they're not drunk. They just received new wine. And you see when you have the Holy Spirit operating in your life. He gives you something that satisfies more than his physical wine, more than his physical drink. He gives you substance. He gives you meaning. He gives you purpose. And when you have an encounter with God and you really talk to the Lord, when you get up off your knees, my friend, your whole situation is changed. God heard her prayer. And my friend, when she prayed that prayer in great anguish and grief, the Lord answered her prayer. I want you to know Eli answered and said, go in peace and may the God of Israel grant you what you have asked of him. Eli said, may the Lord peace be with you and may he give you what you asked for. And don't you know after Hannah prayed out of a broken spirit, when she got up off her knees, she left the place and she was no longer downcast her, her face had smiles on it now she had the joy of the Lord in her spirit because she knew God had heard and answered her prayer way before he delivered she had an assurance that what she asked for was according to God's will and see that's what we ought to do when we pray we ought to pray until we know God has heard us now he said we don't have to pray and we don't have to do repetition but he said if we come to him and ask him, he said if we have the faith the size of a mustard seed, we can say to the mountain, be removed. Stay on your knees until you know God has heard your prayer. You see, sometimes in life, the problems come and our problem and our pain are too deep for words. You mean to tell me I got to pray over a simple cold? Yes, you do, because a cold could turn into pneumonia. And pneumonia could put you in the hospital. I want you to know you ought to pray about everything. There isn't anything that's minute. Everything matters to God. And you see, when you begin to go through life like that, you mean to tell me to pray about everything? Yeah, pray about everything. Paul said, pray about everything. And if you pray about everything, you won't worry about anything. But what we do, we worry about everything and don't pray about nothing and expect God to give us his peace. You can't have God's peace if you don't pray. You can't have God's joy if you don't pray. Yes, you have enemies. Yes, you have financial issues. Yes, you have needs. But when you get on your knees, when you get on your knees and get the Lord involved in your circumstances, he'll turn it around. He took this barren woman and put a child in her womb. God can do it. She went home. She went from the worship service and she got there with her husband. Elkanah lay with his wife and during the course of time, she conceived. My friend, she brought forth a baby boy. And my friend, after the weaning period, she took that little baby down to the temple. And she presented that child to the Lord. But I want you to know, on the day she presented that child to the Lord, she went home by herself. Not only did she make that vow, but she fulfilled her words. She said, Lord, you give me a son. He's not even going to be mine. He's going to be yours. And Samuel was raised up in the temple. Samuel was raised up in church. That's all he knew. And guess what? Eli had two sons. And they were wicked. You read in the second chapter. They were sleeping with the women in the temple. They were stealing the meat. 
They were doing all kind of things, and God got rid of them. As a matter of fact, they were so bad, they gave God a bad reputation. He had to change their whole place of worship from Shiloh to Jerusalem. But I want you to know, Samuel stayed faithful to God. Isn't it strange that sometimes folk could be raised in the same house, some go the wrong way, and some stay on the right path? Isn't it something? How some folk go astray, and they had the same home bringing, the same training, the same Bible. They had the same thing, but they go in different direction. Isn't that strange? But the Lord used Samuel. And guess what Samuel grew up to be? He grew up to be the king giver to Israel. He was used by God. And he stood in the will of God. He rebuked King Saul. Samuel was a judge, he was a priest, and he was faithful to the Lord all of the days of his life. And don't you know, we can pray that prayer for our children. Lord, bless me with my little child. Help me to raise that child according to your will and according to your ways. When I found my son in the pool, face down, not responding, when I pulled Jeremy up out of that pool, I prayed to the Lord first and I asked the Lord not to take my son and then I began to do the CPR and I kept on doing it he was unresponsive and my wife was worried my wife was crying my wife was screaming and I couldn't tell her that her son was dead so I just kept on pumping. I just kept on breathing. I just kept on pumping. I just kept on praying. I just kept on breathing. And Jeremy threw up. And he began to breathe on his own. I want you to know God is able to hear a prayer out of a broken heart. I don't have to hear about somebody who had it happen. I know what God can do. And I know the power of prayer. My friend. God gave me my son back. But there's a lot of people in the world who still like Hannah who can't bear a child. And what they do oftentimes is adopt children. There are many that need love. There are many that need a loving home. Amen. A godly parent. Some of us have already done that. We've taken in relatives. We've taken in our sister's children. We've taken in Amen. And we provided for them a godly home and a godly example. Amen. And the Lord is going to bless us for doing that. Hannah prayed and the Lord answered her prayer. Have you been in a situation lately where you can't work yourself out of it? Maybe you ought to follow Hannah's example. She took her problem to God and God turned her problem around. Don't you know he's able to do that for us today? Amen. He's able to do that for us today. He can turn our situation around. Amen. Lord, we come right now. We thank you for your word today. And we ask, Lord, that you would just allow us to put our trust in you. Help us not to rely on ourselves, but to put our trust in you. Help us to bring our problems to you like Hannah did. Help us to stay on our knees until we have been assured that you've answered our prayer. Help us to be persistent 